All right, everybody, we're going to get started right now. Uh, welcome so, to Jules. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to get get us started. I want to take a minute to welcome everybody um, to this exciting new presentation of Jules Puff Bars and Juice. Oh my, I love this title and what it all means and represents to today. Um, today's presentation is provided by the PA Care Partnership in association with the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services grant. Today, we have Mark Durgan as our host, Jamal Ford. He will be hosting and um, in charge of Q&A. Um, and I, Nancy Massey, will be in charge of the chat. So if you have any questions that are more not directed to the speaker and you wanna direct them to me, uh, put that in the chat. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jamal Ford. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today's presentation will explore the current trend of vaping and the various electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS as they are called that are currently popular amongst adolescents age youth. Discussions will include the effects of nicotine on a developing brain, learning and associated costs that schools absorb, cross-utilization of ENDS devices for cannabis products, as well as difficulties with identifying these devices. Our presenter today is Melissa Grodin, um, who is a human service professional with 26 years of experience in the field. She engages in a person-centered approach to support, educate, and empower those in need. Melissa has worked at the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania incorporated for 14 years overseeing the prevention, school services, and training programs. She has also been an adjunct professor at Chestnut Hill College for 14 years, instructing and writing curricula in both classroom and hybrid format for the School of Continuing and Professional Studies. Melissa is a board certified human services professional, certified family recovery specialist, a certified trainer in Pennsylvania Student Assistance Program, and a youth mental health first aid trainer. She holds a master's degree in administration of human services from Chestnut Hill College with a bachelor's degree in psychology, a minor in criminal justice from Temple University. Um, as Nancy said, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A and let us know if you would like to ask your questions live on our presentation. We will pop you on up so that you can ask your question. And with that, I will turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Jamal. And welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and to see where we have such a well-rounded audience. I do have to give a shout out to all my SAP folks that I see coming in here. And our schools, our juvenile probation, our child serving agencies. This is fantastic to see uh, this representation so we can talk about Jules Puff Bars and Juice, oh my. Um, there's a lot for us to talk about and I'm happy to be here with you. And I do want to thank um, the Pennsylvania Care Partnership for the opportunity to provide this webinar for you today. And again, thank you all for joining. So there's some information I'm going to share. And again, if you have questions, feel free. The first thing that I wanted to share was um, just a little bit more about me. Jamal told you the, you know, the professional background, um, but I have been working with adolescents um, specifically for the past 20 years. I am a former smoker. Uh, if I were a teen today, I would definitely be a teen who vapes. Um, I am a parent to a 17 year old who tells me about a lot of the things that go on with her age group and vaping. Um, but my 17 year old is actually an ambassador for tobacco education and prevention. And I'll, at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So just to see the human side of, of me as well. So today, as we take this journey together, um, I hope by the end of this that you're going to have gained or increased your knowledge on youth vaping. 
And before we get to look like look at all the information, and there's a lot of information, um, but I wanted to start off with looking at some of the impact of vaping on our youth. So hopefully at the end of this, you will understand a little bit more about the products that are out there, see the impact that it has on just like kind of the mind, body and soul, um, looking at some of those health impacts and what resources are available. Please know that everything that I'm going to share is not an all-inclusive list. There's so much information, so many resources. We will share some additional resources with you um, during this once everyone gets settled in so we can uh, give you the tools and the resources to bring back to your communities. So first off, right off the bat, these are the results that we have from the 2021 National Youth Tobacco Survey. And one of the things that is really interesting about this survey is that there were 2 million middle school and high school students that reported using e-cigarettes in the first half of the year when this survey was conducted. Now, Keep in mind, this was also when many schools were closed due to COVID. So this was a lot of use, even though we see some you know, reports that say maybe vaping went down, we're seeing definitely in our schools an increase again, but the survey, what this does is it actually reinforces that the, um, the, the, the flavoring, the devices, the different kind of ways that you can use vapes are appealing to kids, are marketed to kids, and the um, flavor is really one of the main reasons why youth report using this. So uh, it's very addicted. 85% of the kids in this national survey actually reported they use it because of the flavoring. So it's a serious public health concern that we have. Even during the pandemic, it's been a concern and definitely driven by these flavored products. Um, there is a higher rate that we find in more high school students, but I can tell you personally from um, experience in the work that I do with youth, I've also seen it in um, elementary school students, like the upper elementary school students who have used vaping. So I wanna show you a video and the video that um, I'm gonna show you Oh, Susan, what a great question. Um, there is, we're going to get to that. Susan asked, is flavoring combined with nicotine or do kids begin with flavors? And what we're going to see in a little bit later in this presentation is most of these products do actually contain nicotine, um, even some of the ones who claim to be nicotine free. So we're going to look at that. Thank you, Susan. I knew I could count on you for some excellent questions. So the video that I'm gonna show, um, it's the results of a survey that was done in August, 2020. So this was a result of a survey that was done in August, 2020. And the survey was done of 30 cities. Philadelphia was one of the cities that was included. And it's looking at how tobacco retailer density and innovative retail tobacco interventions impact people and their communities. So this video that I'm gonna show you next shows the highlights. Let's get that going for you. Maybe. There we go. Does that surprise anybody when you see that? Is that like, whoa, I didn't know all of that information was, was there and there was that much going on. 
Um, there's a lot. Yeah. Nancy. Wow. Yes. That's so much. Yeah. Joseph, no clue. When I saw this too, I was like, oh my gosh, that is a lot. And so what we see is because there's that accessibility, I know Jennifer more than McDonald's, that, that was something that really surprised me as well. And what happens then is because we have so much accessibility, we have so much of um, the false notion that e-cigarettes or e-products are safe. Um, we see some additional risks that are associated with alcohol, nicotine, and other drug use. Some of you might be familiar with the acronym, a acronym ATOD, Act, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, but we're looking at alcohol, nicotine, and other drugs. So some of the things you can um, see on your slide that, you know, the social and physical environments for our kids, they are seeing people their age use these products. Um, mass media really is promoting it, again, targeting it to youth. Um, high school athletes are actually more likely to use smokeless tobacco or vaping products than those who are the same age who are not athletes, because again, there's a, a, a misconception of what they are. Young people are more likely to use these products if their parents use these products. Um, there is evidence that genetic factors make it harder. We're going to talk about some of the other things that can um, impact genetics with uh, certain risk factors. And we, we should all know, or we all have heard that there is a strong relationship between smoking or use of nicotine and behavioral health concerns. So yes, absolutely, Patrick. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot. And what I had said earlier to our team here today is if we talked about all of this stuff, because there actually absolutely is racial disparity in the targeting of tobacco and nicotine products in so many of our neighborhoods, especially during COVID. And those are so many things that we can, um, we would be here all day or maybe all week if we talked about all of that. But there's definitely research, Patrick, if you're interested in that, that, that we can share with you as well. And um, some personal views, you know, there's things when um, people are expecting, you know, like coping with stress, a, a, a nicotine product to help cope with stress, or a nicotine product to help you lose weight. Um, so some of those things, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I tell kids. Um, the number one reason that we hear so many people say that they use um, nicotine products is as a stress reliever. So what I tell kids is, or youth, we'll use the words youth. Um, what I tell youth is, show me what that looks like. Like, don't, don't do it, but show me the physical action of, of using your vape. And they'll go through it. And what they do is they put the product up. They take a deep breath. You know, they, they inhale deep, they hold it, and then they blow it out. And I say to them, okay, now what does somebody say for you to do when you feel upset? And they usually say, they tell me to take a deep breath. And I say, well, what are you doing when you hit a vape or you smoke a cigarette? What they're doing is they're doing like deep breathing. They're doing yoga breathing. They're, they're doing, you know, they're taking a deep breath in, holding it and blowing it out. So it's actually not the substance that's making them relax. It's the physical act of taking that breath and holding it in. So again, it's you know some misconceptions. Other things that affect um, youth tobacco use is uh, the accessibility, the availability, what we just saw on that slide, low self-esteem, the marketing, not knowing how to say no to products or not wanting to be cool. So we have these kind of initial um, risk factors and the slides we're still working with, Stephanie. So we'll get those slides up um, hopefully either by today or tomorrow where we're, uh, I'm having a little difficulty with getting the, the slides accessible for everyone. So 
just to look at, you know, okay, I keep saying nicotine, 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 not tobacco. So what is nicotine? Nicotine is the addictive drug that is in the tobacco product itself. So one of the things, and this might be surprising for some of you to hear as well, is nicotine is such a highly addictive drug that when people are trying to stop nicotine use, they have found it to be extremely difficult to quit without some kind of tobacco dependence treatment or cessation efforts. And some people have compared the addiction or the dependency on nicotine to be just uh, similar to trying to stop using heroin or other drugs. And I know the first time I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, and I'm a former smoker. So um, it is one of the things that um, you know we wanna be aware of. This is difficult. This truly is an addiction to our youth. What are e-cigarettes? I've mentioned e-cigarettes. Absolutely, Carolyn, it is, it is so hard to stop using substances without support and help. Um, e-cigarettes. So what the heck are those? Because I keep talking about those as well. These are, you know, devices that have so many different names. They might be called e-cigs, e-hookahs, mods, vape pens, vapes, tanks, ends. Um, and I'm also going to show you what some of them look like that you might be surprised to actually see how they are now making these products to look like everyday items. But what e-cigarettes do is they produce an aerosol, they heat the liquid, and it usually does contain nicotine, and they have other flavorings and other chemicals to make the aerosol. They inhale the aerosol into their lungs, and um, these e-cigarettes can also be used to um, use marijuana and other drugs. I'm gonna share some, some information too that just recently hit the headlines um, this week. So we're trying to give you kind of like the basis. Here's, here's the general information. And it's a lot of information. Oh, yes, Carolyn, we are, oh, believe me, we're gonna get there in a second. It, these devices, oh, so much. Um, yes, Michelle, I mean, nicotine is addicted, uh, is addictive, and it's definitely the um, chemicals have, they are known to have um, carcinogens included. So absolutely, it is, it is highly addictive, and it can be highly um, disruptive to your health. So there's different ingredients. We know that there's more than 7,000 chemicals in a cigarette. And all of those things, there's so many different chemicals like rocket fuel, um, art, little traces of arsenic, plastic, there's so many things. But there's also chemicals that are found in vape juice that people aren't aware of. So some of the things that are on there that you'll see, and I'm going to talk about vegetable glycerin and, and propylene gly glycol. Uh, I will also tell you that sometimes I cannot pronounce the names correctly. So please don't judge me for that. And Carolyn, I'm there with you. We're going to get there because this just hit the news last week about, oh, I got so excited. I jumped ahead. Um, yeah, there's some information that's been about being laced with fentanyl as well. So we will get to that. But just some of the additional chemicals that are found in the um that are found in sorry deb i'm trying to ask your question <laughs> and nancy just said don't we're distracting yes i was i was trying to read so i'm going to stop reading your questions put them in the question and answer and then we can talk about them live and in person if you would like so um some of the ingredients so this this uh Propylene glycol is a common additive to food, and it's also used to make things like antifreeze, paint solvent, and the artificial smoke that you find in um, fog machines. There's definitely carcinogens that are included in that, um, one specifically like formaldehyde, um, heavy metals such as nickel, tin, lead, 
um, cadmium, which is a toxic, toxic metal that is found in traditional cigarettes that cause pre breathing problems and um, disease and uh, benzene, which is a volatile organic compound that's found in car exhaust. And Samira, if I'm saying your name correctly, we will be talking about vitamin E as well. So now that we looked at, you know, some like touched briefly on the, oh, absolutely, Brittany, that would definitely be it. If you are allergic, it's in there. So thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, absolutely. So now that we've looked at these ingredients, um, let's look at like, what these things are like, what is vegetable glycerin? What is um, the propylene glycol? So we've got these two different things. So the, the I'm just gonna say PG and VG, so I don't have to try to pronounce the words. So PG uh, is a thin, odorless and flavorless liquid. VG, is slightly thicker in consistency and has a mildly sweet flavor to it. They are the two main ingredients that you're gonna find in vape liquids. And when they're combined in a liquid or juice, they perform the job, they create the vapor, they carry the flavor, and then they dictate how strong or how mild the um, throat hit is. So. You know, Brittany, when you say when your throat was burning, that's going to determine what it is. The PGVG ratio is usually written on an e-liquid bottle and different types of ratios are going to give different effects and work differently with different vape kits. Um, but there was a study that was done by the University of North Carolina that found that these two primary, this VG and PG are toxic to cells. Um, and the more the ingredients in the e-liquid, the greater the toxicity to the individual. So you can see on this slide kind of by the, um, by the actual vape juice container itself, you know, looking at that first one, this vapor density, you can see VG, like it said, it's a little bit thicker and the PG is, is not as well. Um, so that's something that, you know, we want to, you know, just, have an awareness of. And here's another thing. This is something that I found when I was doing the research for this, that I'm like, oh, there's so many other things that are coming. There's salt nick versus something that they refer to as freebase, which I don't like that term. But basically, that is like a traditional smoking a traditional cigarette. So this um, salt nick is um, it's it's tasteless. Um, it doesn't create like a huge hit to the throat, um, but it also, you know, it hits the blood, it crosses that blood brain barrier. It reaches the brain much faster, 10 seconds or less. So a lot of the vape products that we see today actually contain these salt nicks. And what the um, mark, what the the retailers are, is they're saying, oh, this is a safer alternative, um, which is actually not true. So it it's just maybe it's easier to use, so it doesn't give you the discomfort to maybe discourage you from use. So that's something important. Then they have this thing like the synthetic nicotine. So we see synth synthetic nicotine for things like puff bars, which many of you I'm sure have heard because that is now the number one vape product that our kids, are, our youth are using. So the um, like disposable puff bar, um, beady pouches, like oral nicotine products, um, Rush, these products are um, actually, some of these products are going through with approval because it's, it's being looked at as a safer alternative. Um, what the developers say is that there is not the actual tobacco plant is not include is is not part of the makeup of the um, the juice itself, but there still is some form of nicotine in it. So it might not be coming from the actual plant. It might not be coming from the um, tobacco leaf itself 
but it is um, misleading um, because there are still, uh, you still find some um, nicotine. Oh, Angela, yes, there is. The, the interesting thing, I'll talk about that in a minute, because this is, this is going to surprise you. This may surprise you as well. So um, towards the end of that, Angela, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question for you. So we have these, um, you know, we have these different types of juice, different types of ways and, and different types of names and one versus the other, the PG, the VG, the salt nick, um, the synthetics, but what does a device act, well, what, what is the device? Like, what does the device do? So when we look at a, um, and we call them electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, that's what the, um, that is what the preventionists call it. I'll tell you what the, the youth call it um, in a minute. So you basically have these three components that are found typically in an ENDS device. You've got the cartridge that actually holds the liquid itself. You've got the heating device, which we have to be careful about those too, because they can overheat, they can um, blow up. They, there's been some of them that have blown up in um, or exploded in school locker rooms, in kids' um, back pockets. So those heating devices are, are you know, not really regulated well. And the higher you heat, uh, the more likely you're gonna, you know, have some, some negative outcomes from that. Um, and the power source, which is some kind of battery or, or charging. So one of the things to, to really, um, really kind of hone in is to date, and this was as of, you know, maybe last week or this week earlier, no e-cigarette has been approved as a cessation device or authorized to make a modified risk per the FDA and modified, well, we're gonna talk about modifications as well. So I, I mentioned early the, um, earlier this, this pouch like a couple minutes ago. So there are new products that are coming out. Um, and one of these, this is like a, an oral nicotine product. Um, it's similar to something we used to see in the past called snooze. And that what these are is they're smokeless tobacco where it's almost like chew. Um, back in the old days, you know, just picture the image of the baseball player with the, you know, the thing in his mouth. And, you know, um, but these are the kinds of things that um, it doesn't produce saliva. So you don't tap. Oh, Alexander, great. That is great. Any that is great. Um, so they don't produce saliva, so it makes it spitless. Um, it does not contain the leaf, um, the tobacco leaf product, but it still does contain <laughs> nicotine itself. It might not be the you know pure tobacco leaf, but it does contain nicotine products. Um, and uh, you know again the flavoring really, really attracts people. Um, there was a survey that was done for youth in 2020 from the Truth Initiative. And um, they said that uh, in that, it was a self-report from 15 to 24 year olds, 13% um, of the survey respondents in that age range said within the past 30 days of that survey, they had used pouches. Um, so again, uh, this is something that could easily for our school folks, for our county folks, well, for all of you, this is something that is easily hidden, easily used. And it could be, you know, honestly, if hmm, my 15, 16 year old self would probably take that container that you see and put a sticker over it where it says it contains nicotine because it actually looks like a breath mint container. So, you know, I could sit there and just maybe even rip, I'm sure you could probably rip the 
packaging off of it too. And it would just look like I'm putting like a piece of gum or a breath strip or something in my mouth that is not a nicotine product. So again, marketing is fantastic for our young, you know, our young people. So I just told you about a survey that talked about um, people that will, um, yeah, that, that people that were using the pouches, but let's see what some of the other, um, let's see what some other students are reporting. So there is a survey that comes out every two years in Pennsylvania. It's called the Pennsylvania Youth Survey. The 2021 data is gonna be coming soon. So I'm really excited to see what that looks like because we've, I've got up to the 2019 data. So you can actually see here, this is a survey that's done of sixth grade, eighth grade, 10th and 12th grade students. And you can look at the percentage of students and this is a statewide. Um, so in, the Pens in Pennsylvania in 2019, you can see 12% of eighth graders had said that within the past 30 days, the question was how frequently have you used an electronic vapor product such as e-cigarettes, e-cigars, e-pipes, vape pens, e-hookahs, or hookah pens during the past 30 days? 12% of eighth graders, 26% of 10th graders, so we double right there, 33% of 12th graders. So we see the older they get, they do it. Now, what concerns me, we see a really low um, response in sixth grades, but this is what concerns me the most on this slide that I'm gonna show you. Also asked in that question um, in the PACE survey was, what are the, um, if you've used these substances, or if you've used these products, what substances have you used? So eighth graders said, oh, just flavoring, 60%. They just wanted flavoring. 12th grade, they were saying we're using nicotine or we're using marijuana or hash oil. 57% of the sixth graders, I know it was a low percentage, but 57% of sixth graders said, I don't know which means they used a vape product, they used a, an electronic nicotine device, and they didn't know what was in it. To me and for our educators, for our preventionists, this is something that shows me, hey, maybe I want to get some education in fifth grade or the grades before that, because at sixth grade, we've, we're seeing that curiosity peak. We're seeing maybe peer pressure. We're seeing it. And I told you I've seen it in fifth grade just this year. So having that education is, is really, really important. And I'm going to share some of those resources with you. So some of the terminology, because there's a whole terminology now, um, a whole vocabulary, and um, some of the things that, you know, Juul, it's, it is a verb. You know, when, when Juul came out, it became a verb. I am Juuling. People don't say I'm vaping, I'm Juuling. Um, so there's all different types of brands. They all contain e-liquid or e-juice or juice. Um, they also can be called as, yeah, carts, yep. Dabs, dab pens, dab cards, that's usually in, associate, in association with marijuana use. And then we have um, different types of techniques that people use or that you might hear about. Um, they talk about um, drip, dripping, juicing, um, using the uh, e-liquids directly on the heating coil, ghosting. Um, ghosting is something when they are, um, you know, some vape, you know, will, you will see a, a physical cloud come out and um, they hold it, they're gonna swallow it. Or there's, I know uh, there's a lot of people in schools who will um, take a hit off their vape and then they'll blow it into their hoodie or they'll blow it into their sleeve so you can't see it. Um, but really kind of holding it and hiding it is ghosting. Some other things, other terminology that you might hear about is getting nicked. 
Um, and that's the euphoria people feel when um, they are using high doses of nicotine or, you know, really using a lot of um, going through a cartridge, you know, in one sitting. Um, getting nick sick is when people are getting heart palpitations, maybe they're vomiting um, with overuse of the um, nicotine products. Um, another terminology that I just learned about this month is called um, crossed, and that's when you have um, youth that are using alcohol and using a vape product at the same time. They'll say, oh, yeah, I got crossed or I was crossed. And, um, you know, so it's it's a whole culture. And as Nancy said in the um the resources, there's actually a, a terminology resource, uh, like a lingo dictionary for you, um, because it's important to know you people, kids are having these conversations right in front of us, and we don't know what they're talking about, because we don't know the terminology. So there's been an evolution. And I know um, some of you have already commented on it very, you know, at the very beginning, the e-cigarette, it looked like a cigarette. That's why we called it an e-cigarette. And now we've got so many different variations. And this is, I mean, this is, we're not going to see a lot of these. We'll see some of these, but maybe we'll see these with, with older um, adults who are using, um, who are using ENDS devices but I'm gonna show you in a couple minutes the other stuff that we've seen. So vaping, it's actually not a vapor. So what we, to think about kind of vaping, there is a, a there is a cloud that happens, um, but it doesn't kind of burn off the, the products inside. So when you think about like vaping and when um, people are saying that this is something that is um, helpful to quit or it's not as harmful as smoking an actual cigarette, um, there's a, an article that was done or a, a blog from um, jo John Hopkins um, Medicine. And they compared, they, this is what they said. They said vaping is a delivery system similar, simu similar, can't say the word, to a nebulizer. So for those of you who are may maybe not familiar, a nebulizer is something that's used for people that have asthma or breathing problems. And what happens is when you use a nebulizer, you're kind of bathing the lung tissue with a therapeutic mist. When you're vaping, you're actually coating the lungs with potentially harmful chemicals. And those chemicals have been dissolved in an oily liquid base. And that oily liquid base contains a lot of the um, carcinogens that we talk about. So this is a lot. I know this is a lot of information. So the three common, the three most common substances that we see, the, the flavors of the e-liquids, um, the different levels of nicotine, the more nicotine that you have in the um, pods, in the, in the juice is going to be the more impact or the more risk you're seeing. Um, marijuana is also being used. I'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. We are seeing um, University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Sciences, and I know I've got some Pittsburgh people here, so yay, Pittsburgh. Um, they actually found that um, it's actually, this has like a different impact that young adults that are using vape e-device e vape cigarettes are actually four times more likely to begin smoking cigarettes than their peers. And that's actually something that's the opposite of what people think that a vape might do. Um, and part of the reason is uh, because, oh, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to, I'm going to put you on pause for a second on that one. Hold that thought. I'm coming back to that. So we talked about kind of what is in this, what are these chemicals that are in this? Why are people, how many, how many youth are using this? So let's look at some of these devices. This is kind of a device that we see. This looks like a puff bar. This could look like a jewel. Um, you know, I'm going to show you this video now. 
this is the one that, I mean, this is not all inclusive either, but whew, if you were surprised by the first video, here we go. Vapes and electronic cigarettes are becoming harder to identify and more discreet, so we're gonna see how easy it is for people to pick them out. So which of these items in front of you do you think are vape products? Okay, so I'm gonna guess this one. This one. So I think that this is a vape product. Correct. I think that this is a vape product. Correct. This one. It's three. This one. Four. This one. Five. This one. Six. This one. Seven. This one. <laughs> This one? Nope. Nope, okay. <laughs> Fun fact, there are 12 products in front of you. They're hiding them in plain sight, so all these products are kind of stealth devices. Yeah. They're meant to look like other stuff on purpose. Oh. So you'll vape. Oh my god. Yeah. It's creative, right? This is actually a vape. No. So you can hide, it's a watch, you can it hide in like plain sight. It looks like my watch. The trend now is to make them sleek, pretty, you can even get skins for them to match them with your other accessories. Wow, okay, I had no idea. They can wear it around their neck. Yeah, that's crazy. This one actually turns into a heart, so. <gasps> it's Terrifying. a whole lot, but again, these things get hot, so who knows how much they're breaking down, the plastic degrades, you start inhaling stuff, the metal. All the carcinogens comes and everything. Apart, right, yeah. yeah, so you're inhaling metal particles and getting things like factory workers are seeing. So it's, it's kind of hard for adults to, to pin down, like, what am I seeing my teenager use? Because yeah. it's hard to tell if these are chargers for vapes and not no, I would have never guessed. other tech. You can see that they kind of blend in. Yeah. So, and it's kind of hard to, to decipher, like, yeah. these products are a lot more stealth. Okay. And uh, yes, Yolanda, you just segued me right into my next slide. You know, we started seeing when that evolution changed into kind of going into this century, we did see the, um, the inclusion or the introduction of the Jewel, which looked like a flash drive. And it could charge because it has a USB charger. So that was kind of when we all kind of opened our eyes and went like, whoa. This is like much more serious than we knew. And this is when we started seeing so many kids using these products, much more so than we would ever have thought before. So this jewel kind of started a new trend, especially in schools, because kids were charging them on their teachers' laptops. Now we have puff bars. Puff bars are disposable. Um, you know, my 15, 16 year old self definitely would have purchased the puff bar because they're pretty and they have all different flavors. So um, it's really interesting if you have like um, basically like one puff bar is like the equivalent to um, smoking 20 cigarettes. Um, there's different things. Some of them um, have a menthol in it, which menthol is now not a regulated, that menthol is not allowed in cigarettes. So there's things like the FDA, there's wraparounds and some of that synthetic nicotine um, is where there's some kind of the, the loopholes that some of the developers are doing, but I'm not gonna get into that so much. If we talked about the, the practices of the tobacco industry, again, we would be here all day. But this is a very interesting thing. Um, I'm sure you can't see this, but this is actually the warning. It says puff bar can expose you to chemicals, including the G in one of the, P, uh, the PG, which is known to the states of California to cause cancer and nicotine, which is known to the state of California to cause birth defects or other reproductive harm. So right there, the warning, this is not something that's a safe alternative for people. We've got modifications that people do. They make their own custom devices. Um, they start collecting this, like they used to collect Pokemon cards. And um, there's different ways. Like I look at the Altoid one and I think if I were sitting in a class and I just wrapped my hand around that tank and had the, you know, half of the Altoid 
um, container sticking out of my hand, no one would know what I was doing because how many kids actually sit like this? You know, there, well, a lot of them, Nancy's almost sitting like that. I don't know if you can see what Nancy's almost sitting like that. So I mentioned tanks. Tanks are um, extra power. They have a bigger battery. You can use more of the liquids. Um, and it is, um, it's, it sits on top of the battery. And um, again, it's just bigger. So more of our advanced users are going to use this. Now, I want to show you some of these products. And I know some of you already mentioned this. Um, a pen. I'm a pen person. And I actually have pens that look like these, but my pens are not vapes. But this pen is. So again, sitting right in front of you, looking at that. I know we've got a lot of probation on here for you know people that you have under, under your supervision. They might be using that pen right in front of you. Um, this is a marker, but it's a vape. This is a watch and that you saw the watch in the video where it looks like a smartwatch, an everyday smartwatch. You take this part out and that's the part that you use for the vape. Vape wear they have. Um, the, I think now the website has been shut down, but I'm sure you can get it. You can get all of these things. Somebody said, where do you get these things from? Amazon. You can get them from Amazon. You can get them from other retailers, the internet. People get these from everywhere. Amy, thank you so much for that. And then this one, if we have any nurses, this is the one that scares me too. This looks right exactly like an inhaler. So if you have policies in your buildings and your schools that say kids can carry their own inhalers, wow, you know, that's something that, you know, we have to really look at some of our policies and practices. Again, another webinar for another time. Um, we did talk about hookahs. I did mention that. Be and one of the reasons why I want to just mention hookahs is we see a lot of hookah clubs popping up in our neighborhoods. And people think, oh, it's cool. It's chill. We're going to hang out. We're going to have a hookah party. Um, again, just kind of like an hour long hookah session. It's really like almost like smoking a pack of cigarettes in that session. Um, the amount of, of um, the water pipe itself, it, it's going to deliver nicotine to you. And actually because of the way this, the hookah is used, you're actually, people that use it can um, absorb more of the to toxic substances that um, are found in cigarettes, more than a cigarette smoker can because of how much you are getting at that one sitting. And then if you know people don't want to sit around a hookah, because let's talk about other things like you know, the, the mouthpieces might not be clean. You can get a yeast infection in your mouth, you know, their germs, all those things. They also have uh, hookah pens that are, you know, the small version of that. And they do look like more traditional kind of a, a pen device. So there's all of these things. Now we add in subs other substances. So we have people who are using these devices to vape cannabis. And why? Because it's easy, because you can hide it, because some don't smell. Um, and what they're vaping is cannabis concentrates. So a cannabis concentrate is actually more potent. It's a very, it's a highly potent THC. Um, that the appearance of it might look like honey or butter. And basically the, the, the lingo, the terminology for the different concentrates is based on its appearance, on what it looks like. But it actually contains higher levels of THC, ranging from 40 to 80% higher level of THC than like top shelf marijuana. 
these concentrates have. So they are four times stronger than high grade marijuana. That's usually, you might see about like 20% THC. So um, people like to use this again because it's smokeless, sometimes odorless, it's easy. What they do is they take a small amount of the marijuana concentrate, that's why it's that's why it's known as a dab. They take a little dab of it. They put it into the device that has the heating product and they do the vapor that gets the instant high. Now, I know and, and I feel like there is someone from Mifflin County on, on our thing uh, because I saw something in the chat just uh, last week. Yeah, just last week, the Mifflin County School District reported that they have con they confiscated three vape pens that tested positive for fentanyl or heroin. The liquid, the pod, and I know someone mentioned that too, the actual, the pod was altered to include fentanyl or heroin. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what fentanyl is, it is a synthetic opioid um, that's 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. It is a deadly substance. And I, and I do, I don't know who from our county is here, but I would like our, yes, uh, Alita, yes. And that's a very sad story to say, uh, to hear about, because we know once we start hearing about it in one part of our, um, one part of the Commonwealth, we're going to see it. Um, and that, that's my plug to say, you know, make sure you use, you have, you carry Narcan, um, make sure you have that. And I do want to thank the Bucks County um, Drug and Alcohol Commission for sharing that article with me just an hour before I did this presentation. Yeah, two uses of Narcan, that's about right for that. And Penny, yeah, it's, it's so, this is why we want to really uh, attend webinars like this so we can hear about these things and we can have these conversations because tobacco use in school, nicotine use in school, the impact, there's the, the cravings are going to impact learning. Um, low test scores, policy violations. I'm not reading everything because I'm going to another one here. And what's happening is this drains the resources, right? This drains the resources on faculty. It disrupts education. We have a lot of, of staff that are really focusing on a couple people that are using these substances and taking away from the um, educational opportunity for others. For those who are using these, these devices and substances, they're often getting suspended. So their education is, is disrupted as well. They don't have that environment. Not to mention the money that it costs to put vape detectors in, to repair those vape detectors when they get tampered with, um, to send out these, uh, these devices for, sub, for testing as well. So, Using actually nicotine and nicotine products in adolescents harms the parts of the brain that actually control learning, attention, mood, and impulse control. So every time a new memory is created or a new skill is learned, you get stronger connections or synapses that are built between your brain cells. So young people, our youth, they, um, their brain builds the, synap the synapses faster than adult brains and nicotine interrupts how those synapses are formed. And I'm probably saying that word wrong too. But so we look at the brain disruption. Um, oh, Brittany, no, homeschooled people are still, I would, every kid that I work with that vapes, vapes in their home too, and their parents do not know about it. So it's education, right? It's education. Um, nicotine has a half-life of two hours. So um, students who are, are youth that are using nicotine, they are gonna start feeling those withdrawals. They are gonna actually start going through withdrawal within that, that two hours. So that's going to interrupt learning. Um, they are going to feel those symptoms, stress, anxiety. So these are things we wanna pay attention to because there's also a social emotional cost to vaping. Um, there's that loss of sense of belonging and engagement in schools, especially if you're getting suspended, you lose kind of that, that ability. Um, 
typical adolescent development, you're using the substances to make you feel better instead of learning how to deal with, uh, uh, instead of learning how to develop those typical coping skills that many of us had an opportunity to learn through experience without using substances. Um, this is kind of like the, the cycle of vaping. Um, this is basically a, a nice slide saying all the things that I'm saying to you right now. So signs of vape use, um, just being secretive, um, increased thirst, nose, uh, nosebleeds, adding extra spices or flavoring to foods, chronic coughing. So what happens is when you actually, um, oh yeah, perfect. Yes, everything is perfect, right? So when you use nicotine, you get a brief high and that brief high is uh, lends with a surge of endorphins, which increase your levels of dopamine, which is in the reward circuit of your brain. This is a sensation that doesn't last very long. And that's why people keep using it because they wanna get that cessation sensation back. So it takes 10 seconds to reach the brain after you inhale. Short-term exposure, um, you know, less than eight hours of exposure to nicotine can impact your heart and your respiratory system. And um, the risk of nicotine poisoning is also higher due to the level of concentration of the um, substances as well. One of the resources that you have is um, just kind of highlighted on here. It's listening to medical professionals talk about um, you know, really the effect of, of vaping and COVID-19, because we did see, um, you know, we did see a lot of kids start vaping, even though some reports say it decreased, we have seen a lot. Um, Evali is something that people have heard about and it was referred to in one of the videos. Um, it is uh, a medical condition where your lungs um, become damaged. When uh, uh, the individual who was talking about the vitamin E, um, uh, that was found people that were um, getting hospitalized with Evali, they were actually using a um, off market type of vape that was modified that had like this vitamin E, something that starts with an A after it included in that. And what was happening is that was actually causing um, the lungs to be damaged. And we did see some really, really serious effects from people. This is, um, oh, this is also something I actually just found out about myself. You see it, it's not something new, but actually one of my daughter's friends was recently diagnosed with this. Um, cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome, um, CHS is what it is. And basically, this is something that could be based on genetics. Not This does not occur with everybody who is a frequent or a prolonged um, nicotine user or using um, cannabinoids uh, or cannabis in vape products. Um, but basically, uh, it was excessive vomiting, um, many hospitalizations, and base and and pretty much if this individual uses a vape with uh, cannabis in it again they could they are, the probability of them losing their life is high yeah it, yeah i guess a thank you this is something that um you know this is not something that is helpful to people right so it's not something that's good Secondhand emissions, again, it's the same thing. Actually, secondhand emissions from vape um, actually could be more powerful than from a cigarette, depending on the, um, the concentrate, the, the amount of, of what is in there. And I know we're, we're cutting close on time and it's so exciting to talk about these things, but here's just some other information. So there's opportunities that we want to do for vape education. Um, this is the, uh, a couple years ago, we had the Federal Tobacco 21. So somebody asked, how old do you have to be to get this? So here's the thing, there is no age saying that you can't buy tobacco products. The law actually says you uh, a retailer cannot sell 
tobacco products to anyone under the age of 21. It used to be 18, but with some advocacy efforts of a lot of people in, in the Commonwealth, um, Pennsylvania up the age and then a federal bill came in um, to do up to 21. But there is no, like it's, there's no prohibitive age to purchase any of these products there is a prohibited age to sell. And um, I will just say that this little child right here is my little child, my little tobacco educator advocate, um, who she is also, if you have kids, if you have youth that wanna get involved in movements like this, there is something in Pennsylvania called the Tobacco, tobacco Resistance Unit. My child is a Southeast ambassador for that, advocate of the year from last year, have to give that proud mare, uh, mom moment. Um, but this is a statewide, um, <laughs> thank you, Emily. This is a statewide initiative. And uh, they advocate, they speak to legislators, they learn, they get trained, they trained others. This is a great way because youth, educating youth is more powerful than me walking into a school and saying some of these things. They're going to listen to someone closer to their age than someone who remembers when you could smoke on um, airplanes. So different types of how can you get access to Narcan to have on hand? I knew someone was going to ask that question. Great question. Find out who your, if you go to the um, Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs website, ddap.org, um, you can go to find your single county authority. Each county has one agency that can provide, um, that really provides drug and alcohol services. If you go to your single county authority, you should be able to find out how you can access Narcan. There's also, um, there is a standing uh, order in Pennsylvania where anybody can access Narcan. Um, and I think it's like get uh, getnaloxone.org. I'm sure there's somebody in here who can put that in the chat if I'm saying the wrong thing. Um, but worse comes to worse, just Google, how do I get Narcan? And, you know, because you can actually, it's, it's very easy to get. So there are certain programs um, that are actually free and available for people to use. This Catch My Breath, this was uh, through a grant funding with um, CVS. Thank you. Oh, thanks everyone. Yes. Oh, now I forgot the now part. Um, this is a program that has actually uh, can be done in schools. It can be done with small groups. Um, Catch my breath. The website is on here and it is education um, lessons available and it's free. You can get the training online. You can get the materials online. You just have to go through a training yourself. Um, Karen actually has a digital learning progr uh, program, and I did see some Karen SAP people that were on here. Um, and this Connect 5, it's a nicotine reduction and cessation digital experience. And it is a free program that motivates youth towards change and helps them develop personal, personalized plans for success. Um, this is something that actually schools use for policy violators as well. Um, and the resource is here. Vape Educate um, is something that um, is used in schools for that. I'm just gonna go through some of these really quickly in depth. This is another kind of session based. Um, we use this in our agency for tobacco policy violators. Um, this is more kind of a, an alternative to suspension um, group. And um, the same thing not on tobacco is a um, youth cessation program, the quit line. Um, that is for anyone that is free. They will go through, help you set up a quit date, a plan, um, lots of, of things. But there's also My Life, My Quit, which is actually for youth. So this is something that, um, you know, it's a text line and our kids, um, texts, you know, they love the text. So there's so many different ways and different things. So there's a smoke free text line for teens. Again, the slides will be up. So you will have access to all of these. Quit Start is an app. Um, it's a free app. You can get it on Google Play or the Apple Store. 
Um, and that's, you know, anything that you can have that can give you the encouragement. And for some of our kids, they don't like talking about this. So to have a little bit of um, anonymity and being able to seek help is appealing for them as well. Um, the Truth Initiative, lots and lots of information. You've, I'm sure you've seen those um, commercials and Lindsay up in depth, that's been a good one. So looking at future trends, we're gonna find smaller devices, even smaller that we see now. They're going to continue to refine the use of nicotine salts. They're going to keep doing those flavorings to appeal to a younger generation. Um, they are going to increase the disposables. Um, they are going to use smartphones. Smartphones now, there's apps where you can find vape shots or vape shops. Um, yes, actually, Suzanne, I did add, I have to, add, yes, I do have the resources, the video links that I use. And again, um, just the sales itself. So I know there's probably questions. Um, I tried to answer some, but are there like pressing questions that we have? Um, you'll see on that there's additional resources for you. And then we've got a fun little ditty to end it out for those of you who can stay on with us. Thank you, Melissa, for a great presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have some questions that came through on the Q&A, and I would encourage anyone who would like to pop up on the screen and to ask their question live um, to please let us know. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask directly to Melissa right now, um, now is the time to do it. If you want to um, ask your question live, I will start with um, a question from Trina Dow. Um, why isn't nicotine considered a controlled substance like um, benzos? That's a fantastic question. And I think some of this is because um, it really hasn't been viewed as a dangerous substance. Um, and a lot of any legislators are on here. Um, just it is dangerous. It's not safe for people. It is highly addictive. And I would definitely want to include that in with the dangers of other substances. Um, but there is another question on what, why, why isn't there a curtail on this? And we have to think about the fact that there's still a lot of tobacco farms in um, Pennsylvania and they make a lot of money for a lot of people. So um, it is sometimes a battle, but I can say that there are several legislators who are, yeah, money, money. Um, I have seen, there's several legislators who are in support of not having these available to youth. I can't say to, you know, to over 21, but under 21, there's definitely been more attention being raised because of the fact we're seeing so many young people involved with these. Thank you for that question. Okay, so, um, Michael was wondering, um, isn't there legislation, federal and or state, that was legislated years ago that was written against the sales of flavoring in e-cigarettes? The FDA has banned some of those. Um, uh, and it's, it's a constant challenge. So there's been some um, give and takes that have happened. But yes, it is. there is a huge movement to ban all. So cigarettes have bans on menthol, on the use of menthol. We're working on that banning all flavoring for e-liquids. It's it's just um, the FDA is a is a whole nother a whole nother thing, but we're working on it. Okay, so uh, Brenda would like to know um, since mental health plays a role in fourteen year olds. Uh, once you're fourteen, you can refuse treatment. Um, what else can be done to sort of help with that? I think having serious conversations, um, talking about it, finding out why youth are using the substances. What is their motivator? Why are they using it? Um, because then that's what you can address. Um, I find for, for youth that I work with, 
I want to know what are they using it for? Are they using it to relax? Are they using it because they're stressed out? And then let's try to find some natural ways that you can um, feel relaxed and not as stressed. And uh, consistency and persistence. Uh, that's that's really the best thing I have to say for that. So I know we talked a little bit about um, marketing the kids and, and mm -hmm. what they they are or not allowed to do things of that nature. But uh, Tamara wanted to know why are they allowed to market to kids? Like make these things so that they are appealing to to younger people. Um, so there's two things. Uh, well, the, the biggest one is, um, and this is, this sounds so crass to say, um, the tobacco companies are looking for the next generation of nicotine users because the current generation are going to die. So if they get the kids in when they're younger, they are going to be more likely to be lifelong users. Um, so it, it's something there yeah you know it's 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 flashy it's new it's interesting and um you you get someone hooked for life then hmm. that's sad it is and i <laughs> i hate having to put it that way but it's just kind of like you know it's just kind of like the blunt truth it's right the younger you start the more mm -hmm. of a returning customer you're going to be True. That's very true. And they have a lot of money to spend on marketing and advertisements. It's ridiculous the amount of money they have to spend on that. So I have sort of a, um, and this just came through on the chat. And if you could put your questions in the Q&A, it'll be easier for me to catch them because the chat kind of moves so fast. But I thought this was a, a, a interesting follow-up to what I just asked from uh, Lisa Bernard. Um, do you have any suggestion of natural things that kids can use to maybe not vape or do things that, that, that may be better for them? Yeah. So we talked about the fact that when people are vaping, it releases that dopamine, it releases the chemical, um, you know, the excitement to them. So it's looking at what are some of the things that they do that they have fun. When I've um, talked to like elementary school students, I'll talk about, you know, the favorite song that you hear on the radio, or when you get a touchdown in um, football, or, you know, laughter. So it's, it's helping kids understand that you can feel the same way with feeling good about yourself. Um, maybe it's um, maybe it's doing you know meditation and yoga breathing. Um, I had students that I worked with that sat with that con connect connect uh, sand. I don't know whatever that magnetic sand mm -hmm. stuff is. And it, they were like mesmerized by that. And like, I feel so relaxed right now. So it's trying to find things. And one thing isn't going to work for everybody. So it's how can you how can you find out what is the motivator for that particular person, or that kind of group, and finding things, you know, fun things, playing a game, laughing. Um, you know, there are just so many, I, I I'm not going to, I kind of want to say eat a piece of chocolate, but then I also don't want to say eat a piece of chocolate because <laughs> for some people that's not going to be a good thing, right. but, um, you know, just smile, you know, just smile sometimes. So it's, it, there's, it's just, those natural and, and there is a, a natural highs website. And I think it's actually natural highs, um, for some additional things. Um, and I know you mentioned this, um, in a presentation somewhere, I'm not quite sure. I think it was in the Cooper part, but um, Cynthia would like to know um, how many puffs is equivalent to like one cigarette? So I know we talked about in regards to, there's like 200 puffs is the equivalent to like smoking 20 cigarettes. Um, so like, I can find, I'm going to find that because I actually just did see like a graphic mm -hmm. recently that like put it in all of them, or I'm sure I have somebody on this webinar who can give that answer much easier, much faster than I can. 
because I think all of my puff equivalents is to like a pack, a pack of cigarettes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Michael chimed back in and he said, uh, okay, so if it's illegal for someone under 21 to buy alcohol, why would it be not also illegal for someone under 21 to buy tobacco products? And why would the legislation be worded that way? Only punish the seller, not the buyer as well. Um, he's only asking because he knows the students will ask. And I know they just did change uh, a couple of years ago, actually um, changed the tobacco. You, you can't, well, they can't, you can't sell to mm -hmm. someone who was under 21 years of age. So they did, you know, mimic that with alcohol, but um I'll let you answer the rest of it. Well, I can, I'm going to say I actually don't know the answer. And I think that um, it's it's something that, well, I'm going to, I don't know the answer to that. And I think it's because it's this, they look at the regulations on the sellers, not the regulations on the buyers itself. So it's something that um, it's, it's a great question, but I can tell you probably most people don't actually know that. Most people think you cannot buy cigarettes if you are under the age of 21. So I actually am very careful to not educate youth on that little <laughs> fact. <laughs> so uh, Jeanette asked, uh, what would you say to a teen that insists vaping is safe? Um, anything in, in addition to the facts that you stated? Mm -hmm. So I would probably walk through what's been going on. Usually if that kid is talking to me, there's actually a concern already. So I'm going to talk about, okay, this is the, this is the concern. You're here meeting with me. So this is, you know, already we've got something that's interfering with your education or interfering with your behaviors. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk to them about, you know, are you an athlete? You know, this is, this is something like, do you get winded when you climb up a, a set, a, you know, a staircase, are you getting winded? And if you're getting winded, how are you going to, you know, run on a field for that? So it's, it's really just kind of having those, where is it getting you? How much money is it costing you? What are you doing to get this? You know, how do you feel? Because I've had kids tell me, you know, I'm vaping at night to try to go to sleep, but it's actually getting me in my feels. They're getting depressed from it. Like they're mm -hmm. not feeling good. It's they're actually having a negative impact on it. So it's again, looking at, you know, what, what is really happening with you and how can we help work together to try to find like your ultimate goal is to relax or not be depressed or feel happy. How can we figure out how to do that without the substance? Because the substance is only going to get you in trouble. Um, the next few questions I, I, I find very interesting. Um, Alita wants to know how the fentanyl or heroin gets into the vape juices. Um, yeah, there's um, in one of the device, uh, one of the devices in one of the resources um, that are um, on the page, there's actually kind of like how to hack into the devices themselves. So there are ways that you can um, hack, like how you can really modify it yourself. So yeah, people, that's how people are doing it. Okay. Um, Tara asks uh, a question that says, uh, can parents be held legally accountable for supplying a vape to a youth that tests positive for marijuana or fentanyl as a parent could be for supplying minors with alcohol? And I find that one interesting just yeah. because of the sort of the connection that um, with one of the last questions of, you know, people not thinking vaping is... Mm -hmm as dangerous and parents sort of maybe looking past vaping um, and allowing it to happen yeah. where they wouldn't allow a regular cigarette or something like that to be to happen in the house so I I have not heard of any type of social hosting law for vape um, I 
know just from a lot of the schools that I work with that often the vapes that are getting confiscated in the schools have been purchased by the parents. Um, so again, it's that education as well, because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes the same thing with kids thinking it's a less harmful version of things. It's actually parents thinking the same way. And I've noticed this year, more kids are actually using vape for nicotine, which to me, I'm like, wow, like, you know, and, and these are kids who say I'm, I would never smoke a cigarette. Right. So it's, it's just kind of that misper, you know, that, that, that misperception, right? That's a word misperception. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, because it's, it's, it's one of those things because I've heard, you know, um, it's just the juice yeah. um, with no nicotine. And I know just from sort of reading that it, it's not really regulated. So you mm -hmm. don't really know. They can say that it's not anything. Absolutely. It, but typically when these things are tested that they find nicotine amounts or whatever. Yeah. So um, it's all a very interesting kind of thing to kind of go back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron asked this question, which I also found very interesting. Um, she says she's not sure if it's been answered, but I've seen ads for vitamin B12 vapes. Are those getting any traction at all? Um, I haven't heard, like I've heard about it. I haven't seen it in our community, um, but I do know that there's been... Um, <laughs> It's, it's, again, some of this education, um, I do know that, you know, last year or pre COVID, it was really popular for kids to, um, they were vaping essential oils. So, um, you know, it's, it's looking at that, oh, well, this is a easier, quicker, faster way for me to feel a specific way instead of, you know, showing people that this is actually a, a more dangerous way, because it is mm. a faster delivery. It's interesting. Thank you, being healthy. Um, <laughs> can you talk about the cost of vapes? Uh, Alexander would like to know, and how much money um, an average youth will pay. So the device itself can be really cheap or can be really expensive. Um, Though you know, it could be like sixty bucks to get a device. The disposables are obviously cheaper. Um, the cartridges are always going to range in price, but it is, um, I would actually kind of maybe, um, I would think that I'd be pretty confident in saying it's more expensive than buying a carton of cigarettes um, to, to have that, you know, um, but I also know that um, youth are exchanging favors for getting it. Um, unfortunately. Hmm. And kids are making a lot of money in school, buying them in bulk and selling them. Okay. Um, Amy would like to know if you could repeat the details of fentanyl again, uh, meaning yeah. the strength and lethality in comparison to nicotine and marijuana. So, um, Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, and it is about 80 times more powerful than morphine. So when you look at nicotine, when you look at marijuana, um, absolutely, there's a high potency, but fentanyl is deadly. Um, there are a lot of the overdoses that we've seen during the opioid epidemic have been due to the inclusion of fentanyl in um, the substances themselves. So it's, it's scary. It's really, really scary. And kids don't know. They don't know if something's going to be cut with it. If something, mm -hmm. they don't know if they're buying it off other people. They they really don't know what's in it. Look at that. Look at the statistics from the sixth graders yeah. that we showed in Pays. So Richard would like to know if it's true that metal pieces are getting in your lungs when vaping. Yeah, I mean, there's part of the um, part of the chemicals are metal based. Angela would like to know how can the government be made to fund public service announcement announcements warning parents and people about the dangers of vaping. 
there actually is, there's a master settlement agreement um, that was um, from Big Tobacco and there is money that is given to the Commonwealth each year to fund um, tobacco prevention and education services. And part of what the um, tobacco resistant unit and a lot of our tobacco providers, part of what we do every year is to advocate to um, keep that money because the entire amount of the master settlement agreement doesn't all go to tobacco control and prevention. It goes to some other budgetary items, um, but there there is money, but it's not it's it's pennies compared to the money that the um, tobacco companies have for their own marketing. Okay. Um, couple more questions before we close out. Um, Maribel, as a parent of a 20 year old that is vaping, how can I find out what's in it? <laughs> so Maribel, if you are, if your, um, if your child is actually open to you that they're vaping, like if you've had the discussions, then I would ask them what's in it. What are you vaping? Um, if not, then it might just be find out if there's a if there's some place um, near you or see if your local what your police station does um, about testing the substance. Uh, but be careful as well if it's you know illegal substances. Um, but I I would just I would ask if if you if it's kind of uh, widely known in your family that that your child uses that. All right, and this will be our last question for today. Um, when pods are altered to include THC components in combination with flavored chemicals, does this mask the typical odor of marijuana? Yeah, there are some that are odorless. Um, so there's, you know, even when you have people that are um, vaping um, medical marijuana, um, there's some that, you know, you can have a very strong odor and there's some that you cannot tell at all. That's why it is, um, so exciting and appealing to our youth. Oh, thank you so much, Nicole. And I do have, this is Mark. I do have one person, uh, Karen Johnson, that wants to ask a question live. So, okay. Okay. And then we're running over, we're running close, but I'm going to let her bring her up. Oh, wrong one. Okay, Karen, you should be there. And you're muted. Unmute. There I am. Now I'm on. Yep. Am I on? Yep, yep. You're, you're on. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Melissa. That was wonderful as always. You do a great job. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, this morning I got an email from I do tobacco in five counties, including Mifflin, and I got an email from Mifflin. Um, I gave them your contact information because I said I'm I'm on some webinars. Um, I know this was recorded. Um, are you planning on using it any other way? They want to do something for parents. So I just want to, for, first of all, they're going to be reaching out to you, um, Okay. but um, I don't know whether you want to give them the recorded. They want to actually do a big community event. So I just wanted to put that out there because I just got that this morning. Okay. We can talk, Karen. Karen and I okay. go way back. Yep. Yeah, we can talk. Oh, okay. Angela, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. This is the, this is the part of the webinar where everyone makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are recording and it will be posted on our website um, and also on our uh, Vimeo channel. So you should be able to get it there as well. Vimeo. Vimeo? Yeah, Vimeo. Vimeo, yeah. Not Vim. Vim. All right, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Um, thank you, Melissa, for a great presentation. Uh, thank great you. Presentation. Um, our next presentation is Beyond Respite as a Service. Respite care does not have to cost money by Betsy McMichael, um, Thursday, March 17th, 2022, from 2.30 to 4 p.m. And we look forward to having you all join us again. Until then, everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. <laughs>